Aloha and mahalo for joining co-council and the Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans. We start today's program with Kukua Council Director Dawn Smith. Please give her your attention. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act of 1921 gave Native Hawaiians the right to claim leased land on which to build a homestead. That was 101 years ago. The problem was that the act had no enforcement language and was hugely unsuccessful in fulfilling its mandate. The Kokua Council is recognizing the two attorneys who 23 years ago filed suit on behalf of a class of Hawaiian claimants and were recently successful in obtaining funds for those recipients. That's right, the act was passed over 100 years ago and the partial victory for a subgroup of those Hawaiians took 23 years of litigation. However, thousands of valid claimants passed on before they were granted a homestead. We would like to honor and remember those Hawaiians today. This unfortunate set of events evokes recognition that we have many relevant and necessary laws legislated and enacted each year, but so many of these laws lack enforcement. Enforcement could include funds to implement that legislation, or it could include criminal or civil penalties to ensure obedience to the statutes. It is hoped that future legislators will try harder to enact legislation that has enforcement contact, content, excuse me, so that our laws and statutes that we all worked hard to create have some teeth. Thank you for the opportunity to make this short presentation. And I especially appreciate the candidates here today who took time to attend and speak at Kokua Council's The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly program. Mahalo. Thank you, Don. Next, please meet Justin Wong, president of the Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans. Okay. On behalf of the uh, Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, 16th annual presentation of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, This is an assessment of the 2022 legislative session sponsored by uh, the Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans and Cocoa Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, greetings, everyone. I'm Lila Moore, President of Cocoa Council, one of Hawaii's oldest advo advocacy organizations. We engage those who are interested in shaping the future and the well being of our community. Collectively, we're known as Kuku Council, and many of us are independent consumer protection and community activists, or active within other organizations, such as AARP, Alzheimer's Association of Hawaii, Condo Owners Coalition of Hawaii, Green Wheel Food Hub, Hawaii Family Caregivers Coalition, Hawaii Meals on Wheels, Hawaii Pacific Gerontological Society, Hui Oyayo, the Policy Advisory Board for Elder Affairs in the State's Executive Office on Aging, Pono Action, and the Rotary. Today, our guests are our state legislators and luminaries who we recognize for their contributions to our community. Since 2008, we have presented the Shining Light Award to outstanding advocates for seniors and for those who cannot advocate for themselves. Past President Emeritus Larry Geller and first Vice President Rick Tabor will present the Shining Light Awards. Larry, will you please do the honors and present the first two Shining Light Awards? These are the certificates. Thank you, Lila. Um, I wrote a few words, so I'll read them. Um, legislators and onlookers cheered and applauded in the state capitol conference room in early May as they voted to approve a historic appropriation of $328 million to fund a settlement in the decades long Kalima lawsuit. This lawsuit has been argued since 1999 by attorneys Thomas Grande and Carl Verity, co-counsel in the case. 
Both attorneys have given at least 23 years of their lives, more probably in the preparation for filing, 23 years of their lives to fighting for a class of Native Hawaiians who are entitled to receive homesteads as part of, the, of an obligation the state of Hawaii agreed to as a condition of statehood in 1959. The state resisted the class action suit at every turn. Even after the case was settled, the state refused to agree on damages. About 1,000 beneficiaries have died without receiving any relief. I watched the attorney's hair turn gray and then turn white as they relentlessly fought for the Native Hawaiian class members with no assurance of victory as the case dragged on, dragged on. The governor is expected to sign the appropriation, ending the battle with victory for the class members. A circuit, ju a circuit court judge must sign off on it for it to be final. Plaintiff Leona Kalima said the settlement will change thousands of lives for the better. Kukua Council and the Hawaii Alliance of Retired Americans are proud to award 2022 Shining Light Awards to Carl Verity and Thomas Grande. And if, uh, if you'd like, Tom and Carl, if you'd like to say a few words, uh, please unmute your audio and have at it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'll go first, if that's okay, Carl. Fire away. It is an honor to accept this award on behalf of our 1,700 living clients and on behalf of the families of our nearly 1,000 deceased clients. I'd like to thank the Kokua Council for Senior Citizens and the Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans for your tireless advocacy on behalf of seniors. You are on the front lines of activism and know very well that it takes a multi-year vision and a multi-year commitment to achieve significant social change. I'd also like to thank our class members and their families. Resolution of this case 23 years after it was filed is a testament to their commitment, to their resi resiliency, and to their fight for justice in the face of decades of neglect and strenuous opposition to their cause. Our client's success should be an inspiration to activists to recognize that the fight for social justice, in some cases, takes a lifelong commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, go, ahead, go ahead. No, I, I just, uh, I would also like to say uh, thank you to the Kokua Council, Lila, Larry, your members, fantastic assembly of organizations that are doing good works in this community uh, and uh, putting the effort in that few people are willing to do to uh, make sure that the uh, uh, legislative uh, agenda is being accurately reported and monitored for the benefit of all of our, all of our citizens. Uh, I also like to thank uh, the Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans and Justin Wong, their board and members. Like Tom, I'm eternally grateful for the opportunity to serve our class members who have been uh, so uh, supportive and their families uh, and acknowledge uh, the loss of the families who uh, some 1,000 class members who are with us at the beginning of this lawsuit have passed during the more than two decades that we've been fighting it. <laughs> Excuse me. They've, uh, they have embodied the concept of Ho'omanawanui, that is steadfast patience and commitment to seeing this uh, case through to its end. I believe it's really fitting that groups that seek to serve and empower kupuna in our community are gathering today to honor this work. It is a collaborative effort, something that is shared between us and our clients and the community as a whole. Speaker Psyche, when announcing this settlement, mentioned uh, Dr. King's 
reference to the arc of justice and commented that the uh, bottom line is that the arc of justice has shifted in Hawaii. As a result of this settlement, the uh, appropriation to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands and several other bills. I think it's undeniable that with the leadership of Speaker Psyche, Representative Luke, President Kochi, and the members of the Senate, that things have changed and there has been a tectonic shift in those issues this year. I think of the shift differently though. I think of it as the legislature moving the state toward fulfillment of its sacred duty as a trustee to provide rehabilitation to native Hawaiians and protect and preserve their land. Doing that moves the entire state closer to the arc of justice, which is eternal and unmoving. Like Tom, I accept this award on behalf of the plaintiffs who now after really three decades, if you count the administrative process that preceded this case, can begin to benefit from the sacred promise of the state to rehabilitate them through the Hawaii Homes Commission Act created 101 years ago. I'm humbled by the chance to serve these kapuna over the past 22 years. And I'm grateful to have played a role in bringing the state closer to the arc of justice for Hawaiian homesteaders through this work. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Tom and Carl. There are no words to thank you for your dedication, your hard work. Um, I move to tears. Thank you, congratulations. Aloha Rick, Rick Tabor, will you please help me and do the honors for our next award? I would be honored to. So one of my favorite people in the world is Michelle Cordaro Lee. And in the last couple of years with the pandemic going on, um, she and her team of Hawaii Meals on Wheels, including Doug here, um, stepped it up and stepped it up in ways that um, uh, it just, just blows me away. I, I happen to be vice president on the board and I deliver meals. So I've been there uh, um, through the whole process. I'm letting people in while I'm doing this. <laughs> and I've just been so impressed. Um, we didn't give a, an award last year because of uh, the pandemic. And so it's, it's really just that we have three incredible awardees this year to honor. And um, I, I, without further ado, I'm just gonna let Michelle just kind of talk about what, what, what happened, what she did. There's stats that are just mind boggling that um, very impressive. So Hawaii Meals on Wheels, of course, responded to food insecurity, but we also responded to isolation and, and the social needs and other needs that folks had. Michelle, could you tell us a little bit about what all happened? Sure. Thank you so much. Just It's been just a wonderful honor to have this. Um, and on behalf of Hawaii Meals on Wheels, it just speaks to everything that and everyone who supported the work that we've done. Um, Pre-pandemic, we were at 97,000 meals annually. And during the pandemic, we jumped to 175,000 meals. And it really brought food insecurity in our Kapuna population to light. And we're just very grateful that Kokua Council, Lila, Rick, Doug, um, Kathy White, every, every member out there, as well as Justin Wong from Hara, that you support the work that we do. Um, so many of our Kapuna who, are, who have been sheltering in even prior to the pandemic did not have a voice um, could not be seen, and many of them didn't realize, or many of our public didn't realize how many kapuna are immobile in their homes. Um, so we're just very grateful um, at Hawaii Meals on Wheels to accept to accept this award. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Congratulations for wonderful, wonderful, successful couple of years over the pandemic. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next, let me introduce Barbara Service, director on both the boards of Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans and Kokua Council. Barbara? 
Thank you, Lila. I just uh, want to say a few words about bills which passed and, and also bills which didn't. Driver's licenses, um, uh, the bill passed, so you don't have to uh, apply for uh, every two years for a driver's license until you hit 80, which um, is great. It seems like I just got my driver's license. Now I have to go right back in and get it. So that's an improvement. Uh, of, of great importance was the passing of the state budget, which included one and a half million dollars for uh, the ADRC, Aging and Disability Resource Center, and an, and an additional two and a half million dollars for Kapuna Care. And uh, importantly, because we've been waiting years for this, five full-time positions for the um, uh, long-term care ombudsman's office. Um, other things uh, that passed were raising the ceiling for the Office of Healthcare Assurance, who is responsible for licensing care homes and nursing homes. Um, adult dental benefits have been reinstated and um, funds for nursing homes, uh, enhanced funding for nursing homes, which accept uh, Medicaid patients. Bills that didn't pass that we're gonna be working on again next year are the state health insurance program, um, which is uh, federally funded, but we need some state funding in there to get more volunteers, more people need to know about their rights under Medicare. Healthy Aging Partnerships, which is uh, a um, evidence-based program for health, diabetes especially, but also exercise and how that keeps people active and involved. Our Care, Our Choice, the Physician Assisted Suicide Bill, um, did not pass. And we're hoping that that will go through next year. Hearing aids, which has been a problem for a long time, trying to get funding. We did get a resolution to involve the auditor, the state auditor. So we're going to be getting to work on that. And I think, uh, oh, two, two bills that don't necessarily pertain to seniors but of great importance are minimum wage bill passed and also Hawaii savings, uh, Hawaii retirement savings bill passed, which uh, will really help all uh, folks in Hawaii. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Lila. Uh, so next, let's go into our um, assessment. Let's begin the assessment of the 2022 legislative sessions and then we'll open the floor to questions. I'm going to introduce the legislators chronologically as they enter the meeting. So Representative Ward, if you'll please start. Okay, the early bird gets the worm, not uh, <laughs> somebody who's the minority <laughs> and with a last name that starts with the W, which is usually last. So thank you, Lila. Thank you, Coco Council, for the invitation. It's while things are still fresh, I think your timing is, is very good. And I love the way you started out acknowledging the heroes in Meals for Wheels and for the long, long arduous case of the Kalima case. Congratulations to you gentlemen who brought that to fruition. That's very, very important. Now the test of the pudding obviously is in the eating. We gotta make sure that this doesn't just happen to be a blurb on the uh, the radar screen and that we consistently follow through what otherwise has been a hundred years of a failed policy to build uh, road and build ha houses for the Hawaiians. Having said that, uh, Lila, I'm gonna give an overview kind of as, as you wanted, but it's gonna be like in the form of a, a grade point, if you will, uh, grading the session and then kind of giving it a quick uh, wrap up. These are not necessarily for seniors only, but it's for the general uh, perception of I see is the 2022. My biggest takeaway uh, are two. First, it's amazing what you can do when you have a couple of billion dollars uh, of surplus. Uh, secondly, it's amazing what you can do when you get political will. Now, is there a correlation between a budget surplus and a political will? I leave that to you. But it's amazing what we could do. And overall, I think we, we did a B plus session on Hawaiian issues, clearly A plus. On OHA, we still haven't really satisf satisfied the 20% with net uh, 
versus the gross revenues that we're still debating. Uh, that, that is an issue still there. Uh, probably one of the worst grades I would give this section is the no bail bill. I would put that as an F. I think uh, crime is up and we've got uh, more social justice uh, issues ahead of what otherwise is the protection and the safety of our, of our kufuna. Uh, ranked choice voting is not in, in our favor at all. And uh, I would not grade that high, but we got a B plus for vaping. As you know, all of you who are vaping on this call, probably not very many, if any, uh, that passed and there are no flavors that are available. Uh, kudos to the teachers, the salary, uh, Increase went through and the steps. Uh, I would say probably for parental rights, we kind of went uh, backwards with, even though the bill didn't pass, it was where we were gonna give a $2,000 fine and a year in jail for parents who spoke up uh, rather vociferously uh, against the education worker, which would be an administrator or a teacher. Uh, you already mentioned the good things on the budget and I know Representative uh, Sylvia Luke is gonna speak in more detail about that. And overall, it was terrific. The only thing I had a problem with the budget is the surplus that we gave out was only $300. And it should have been more because in the constitution, it says we could actually uh, give it back to the taxpayer. Even though I know the rainy day fund is important to do that. <clears throat> Another thing economically, I think we missed an opportunity, even though it's still not totally closed, to start the first pharmaceutical industry in the state of Hawaii, and that is with the Oceanit and their COVID-19 test that, they, they, that uh, has been developed. And hopefully, we, and with the FDA approval, uh, and I leave this to, and give kudos to uh, Sylvia Luke, that in the budget, there was a, an amount, if we can pre-order from them, they can actually establish the first pharmaceutical industry, which is COVID, but for anything, they got 65 PhDs, and Patrick Sullivan is the key behind that. Uh, I give an A plus for Red Hill. That is a terrific development, even though it's not implemented yet. I think we did the right thing in mandating that they got to shut that thing down and move it. Uh, no fundraisers during the session. I gave a B. Well, it's about time, but if you look at the Cullen and the English um, criminality, it really didn't have anything to do with fundraisers. It had to do with things that were killing or not killing bills and getting things on the side, not necessarily at any time during the session. Even though the bills come during the session, uh, that's the only, I guess, uh, pin could eat. Well, uh, coffee labeling, I think, was very good. Minimum wage was long overdue. And uh, the Mauna Kea bill, uh, still a bit controversial and volatile. But as most people said who voted for it, as I did, or I, no, I don't think I did, I had res reservations because it's better than nothing, but it's something that I think has got a, still a long ways to go. Uh, lastly, in conclusion, Lila, some couple of silly bills. We had a bill that didn't pass, fortunately, because it was going to put bidets in the Capitol. Anybody who's used the debate knows it doesn't save water or toilet paper, and that was the preamble of it. And lastly, we probably could do a better job with feral cats and the feral chickens that are unfortunately populating our neighborhood. And no, no offense to our president, uh, Kochi from Kauai, which is kind of the, the feral chicken island, but it's something that doesn't fit too well within our neighborhoods. Having said that, I think we did a good job, but we can do a better job if we keep with what we've done with the Hawaiian issues consistently and continually, I think we will have uh, fared very well. And this is an election year. So again, uh, virtue signaling is probably tantamount more so than in other years, but everybody now everywhere is up for re-election, including yours truly. So thank you, Lila, and thank you uh, for the invitation to the House. Aloha. I'll be here for any questions. Yes, thank you. All right, Senator Moriwaki, are you there? You're just Hi, Senator Moriwaki. Hi, Lila, it's Heather. She's still not here yet. Maybe we can circle around when she gets back. Certainly. All right, let's Thank do you. that. Um, next, since we're going chronologically, would be Senate President Ron Kouchi. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so I guess um, 
the long and the short of it is there has been much discussion about the challenges of 2020 and 2021. And it forced the legislature to take some really hard looks at every aspect of the budget to see what it is that we absolutely needed, where uh, cuts could potentially be made because of the decline in revenue. And then working with federal partners uh, and the money that we were getting there to try to ensure that we could deliver services. So having said that, the first big thank you that I'd like to give is to all of the private philanthropy. In 2020 and 2021, there is no way we could have met all of the needs of those impacted in our community by COVID without the private money that came in uh, to help meet, meet the need. Along with the thank you to the money, it couldn't have been deployed and the work would not have been possible without all of you and the incredible volunteerism that we also had for us to deal with the issues that faced us in 2020 and 2021. Now, this may surprise you because I'm a Democrat, so I have a little different view from uh, the Republican perspective. It wasn't a matter of having the money and it wasn't a matter of having the political will. It's a matter of greatness being defined by those who when confronted with adversity or disaster, realize and see the opportunity. And I think the leadership in the House and the Senate having stared in the abyss for two years and what was going to potentially be devastating to the people of Hawaii, were able to know where we needed to shore up where was the help absolutely needed and what we would do when we would uh, have the funds available to do right by the people of Hawaii. And the work product that you see at the end of this session is reflective of having done that analysis for two years, having dealt with the worst case scenario and having a tremendous grasp of what we needed to fund and where our resources needed to be deployed Everybody forgets that we were meeting with House Senate leadership and the governor at the beginning in January of 2020 with the five point plan. We wanted universal pre-K, we wanted to increase uh, or permanent, uh, make permanent the earned income tax credit, raise the minimum wage, improve the building of school facilities and a strong commitment for affordable housing when COVID hit. And if you look at the centerpiece of everything that we did, those five points dating back to January of 2020, were always there. But I'm gonna stop now because I've uh, got Senator Baker, Senator Moriwaki, Senator Chang, and Senator San Buenaventura who have worked hard in this space along with the House members who can give you much better detail. So I'm gonna just close with two personal facts. First, to the Meals and Wheels, thank you, my mother uh, on Kauai through the pandemic uh, and some uh, physical injury is now a uh, participant in the program. And uh, with me being in Honolulu half the time for session, I'm appreciative knowing that she has that meal being delivered to her on a regular basis. The second thing, I was in Seattle for a conference and my wife and I returned to Kauai last night and waiting for me in my mailbox was my uh, letter to fill out my information for well care so that I can make the correct choice for Medicare benefits. So as one of you, I am truly appreciative of all of the work that you're doing for our experienced community. So thank you very much. And I'll let uh, you know, my committee chairs go into much greater detail. You're muted, Lila. Lila, you're muted. Thank you, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Senator Kouchi. Next up is Senator Baker. We're going chronologically. I also want to recognize that about a dozen years ago, Senator Baker, you were one of our awardees for the Shining Light. Thank you very much. Your assessment, please. 
Yes, I was. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a very interesting session, uh, particularly coming off of the pandemic. We started out with no people around and then were able to uh, uh, have people at the Capitol. I think one of the things that I consider us very fortunate in is that the legislature had spent resources prior to this trying to improve our, our distance capability so that we could have meetings on Zoom, we could continue the work that was necessary. Uh, and I think it really made, for somebody who represents uh, the neighbor islands and our folks can't always get to the Capitol, it made it possible for them to participate, to feel like their voices were being heard. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, the leadership in both the House and the Senate for ensuring that uh, that technology that we had the capability of was actually being used. And I know some of our uh, members who may have uh, been in situations where they felt uncomfortable coming could still participate. And so um, I just, I think we were able to make strides as a result of some of the technology and the rules that we had in place. So I'm very appreciative for that. Uh, I am going to be uh, joining the ranks of the retired at the end of my term in November. Uh, so I'll get a chance to be an advocate from a different point of view, uh, not being with the committee, but uh, I have to say that I've been so fortunate to have worked with such wonderful members, both in the Senate and the House, uh, the leadership in our money committees, as well as of the other committees, have made it um, such a joy. And I've been able to see how we've improved uh, the opportunities for people to participate. Uh, and we're, we're very fortunate in the staff that we have as well. So I look forward to continuing to be an advocate, but from a different perspective. And uh, I just wanna say that um, working in the area of consumer protection, I've seen how important it is that the boards and commissions that we have that take care of licensing for the various professions. So we need volunteers on those. If any people out there would like to participate, I know uh, DCCA would like to hear from you because we do need uh, volunteers on all of our boards and commissions, but also just to continue to stay engaged and let us, uh, let, us let all the members hear from you, uh, whether it's uh, for some new insurance uh, measures that need to be enacted. Uh, we did a lot of work uh, with condominium law this year, as well as making sure that uh, we have the appropriate not only health insurance, but automobile insurance and unemployment uh, insurance in place. So I think uh, I would give our session uh, at least an A, um, maybe in some areas uh, a little bit higher, maybe other areas not so high. But I think overall, uh, the members really pulled together to try to make sure that through this session and the previous session, that we had an opportunity to hear from the public and we worked our best to enact laws that are gonna move the, the state forward. So I was a very appreciative uh, that my uh, last regular session of the Senate, I understand is gonna come back and confirm judges. So I'll be at the Capitol one more time while I still have a Senator in front of my name. Uh, but it, and it was, a, for our last session, it was a very, uh, I think a very productive session and I was glad to be a part of this uh, Senate and legislative session. Mahalo. Senator Baker, thank you very much. And just to give you a word of warning, once you become a retired person, you might be busier than you are now. <laughs> All right, up next is Representative Luke talking about money committees. Representative Luke? Well, it's so fitting that I'm going right after Senator Baker because one of the things that I did want to say is if you could all join me in just thanking uh, Senator Baker for her years of service. Good job, Roz. And, you know, one of the things that I always tell um, Senator Baker is, um, uh, you, you know, in the legislature, we have hardworking individuals, and she's one of those workhorses who's there vetting through um, 
bills and deciphering what is needed to be done, what are some of the things that uh, the, the state, and especially for um, health and welfare of our citizens and, and women's issues. I mean, she's been in the forefront of many of these issues for decades, and it is going to be a true loss uh, at the legislature, but at the same time, she's going to be uh, a strong advocate um, in the community to uh, bring those voices in the legislature. And so I have utmost respect for uh, Roz, my friend, and I'm gonna miss you. So. Thank you for your years of service. Some of the things that we passed this year would not have been possible without Ross. So one of the things um, that I wanna say is when you look at the, the legislature and when you look at the budget and the bills, budget, and I'm going to just generalize, the budget and the things that we fund is a reflection of the body's values. So this year, when because when there's a uh, there's an avenue because of revenues and because we weren't restricted to some extent by hey you know we only have so much and we have to just um, look at doing here and look at here look at some other um, programs here and there when there was a means to do it where did the legislature put their values. And number one, above all, was taking care of our obligations to Native Hawaiians and taking care of our safety net. And if we could just put it into words, what happened this year, that's where the values and the hearts of, of the members of the legislature came through in very loud voices. So number one, in addition to congratulations to Carl and um, Tom for your uh, decades of working on the Kalima case. And so this year, along with the pending litigation, it wasn't just about the will, it was about ensuring and meeting that obligation. So legislative leaders work really hard to push the AG to a point to come to this settlement and come to this point. So thank you to Carl and Tom for your patience and for your work and um, your willingness to work with the state and the attorney general's office to coming to a resolution. I think if we had not, not done this this year, um, we may never have done it even, you know, we may not have done it in the next 10 years and 20 years. And can you imagine trying to litigate the 1700 um, individual damages cases that would have been just, um, just an arduous and painful process. So I'm glad we're at this point um, coming, closing out the session with the settlement of Kalima. So it wasn't just about Kalima, it was DHHL, it was OHA, it was taking care of many of our um, culture and heritage, including making sure that Bishop Museum is taking care of Iolani Palace, Kaolave Reserve, um, funding the Hawaiian medium preschool pathway through Imiloa is to uh, to support charter schools that have a lot of Hawaiian immersion program. It was different areas of strengthening heritage and culture. And I think that spoke volumes of where the hearts and minds of this legislature was. And it's really the hearts and minds of not just this legislature, but where the community was. And also um, talking about Mauna Kea, bringing Native Hawaiian voices in the deliberation and management of Mauna Kea. I think that was significant. The second thing really was about taking care of the safety net. Raz and others uh, were instrumental in making sure that postpartum coverage got extended from two months to 12 months. Adult dental for the first time since 2009 got reinstated. Um, as um, others mentioned, um, five uh, long-term care ombudsmen for all islands, ensuring that ambulances were taken care of, making sure that um, many of the safety net programs, uh, including, um, I'm gonna leave it to Joy and others to talk about Ohana zones and homeless services, including um, many of the, um, many of the uh, health and safety needs. So the, 
I think this year, um, the legislators really worked hard, thanks to many of you folks and many of the community voices and the champions that we have in the legislature, including the Kupuna Caucus um, leaders, including the, the women's caucus leaders, many of the individuals who are here. It is really about collaboration. It's not just about the collaboration between the House and the Senate. People think collaboration is just between the House and the Senate. It's not. It's a collaboration of the House and the Senate with the departments, with community leaders, with community voices. And it was really the community and all of us pooling this ship together. I think now that we have made huge investments, $600 million for DHHL, our job is not done. We have to make sure it's done right and we have to make sure that it is spent so that maximum number of people get on land. $200 million for preschool. We have to build those preschool that could lead to about 2,000 to 4,000 more kids being able to go to preschool. $300 million for affordable rentals. It's going to be on um, many of you, like Troy and Sharon and others, to make sure that those units get built that could result in close to five to 6,000 units. I mean, these are exciting things. And these are the things that um, Roz won't be there, but these are the things that Roz could look back and I could look back and say, hey, you know what? We did it and we did it. You know, five years down the line, we're going to see these preschools and housing and, you know, it's just going to be gratifying. So mahalo to you folks and keep up the good work and thank you for your advocacy. We're going to miss you, Sylvia. Laila, you are still on mute. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next would be Senator Stanley Chang. Hello, Senator Chang. Good afternoon, Lila, and um, it's great to be here, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. It's a little intimidating to come after such um, uh, influential members as Representatives Luke and Senators Kochi and Baker. And I did want to echo um, their words because I think by any measure, it's been such a really um, productive legislative session, certainly the most productive out of my six years here. Um, since I do chair the Senate Committee on Housing, I'll just talk about a few of the highlights of our work in the Housing Committee with um, Chair Nakamura of the House Committee on Housing. I'll start with the huge amounts of funding that have already been mentioned, the $600 million to DHHL, the further $300 million to the Rental Housing Revolving Fund, a smaller um, appropriation that I'm particularly proud of because it's low hanging fruit is Senate Bill 2588, which um, addresses one thing that we learned this session, which is that there are 264 Hawaii Public Housing Authority units that are vacant statewide because they violate health and safety requirements. And so this funding would be to repair those units and get those units um, occupied by low-income families right away. I do think it's the lowest hanging fruit on housing in the, um, in the whole state right now, and I'm very pleased that that bill moved forward. Um, we passed um, a bill to help provide infrastructure and to help the financing of infrastructure by, by the private sector in transit-oriented development infrastructure improvement districts, SB 2898, to follow up um, on a bill that was vetoed for technical reasons last year. Um, I see Representative um, Hashimoto is here, so I'll, I'll leave it to him to address some of the House measures, but to wrap up with this final um, group of Senate measures that I'm very excited about, um, as you know, we've all been discussing the housing shortage here in Hawaii for many, many years. Um, and over the years in my work, we've been looking at various models around the world, particularly the Singapore and Vienna models. Um, and this year, for the first time, um, we were able to pass a couple of measures that enable HHFDC and HPHA to build those units. So SB 2251 allows HPHA um, 
Currently, they're only allowed to build federal public housing, which is a highly regulated term, which requires, you know, all kinds of restrictions on income and so on. This bill allows them to build um, a much broader range of housing, including housing for mixed income individuals. So that's a step towards them um, constructing housing for everyone in our community and not just the very poor. Um, the counterpart to that bill for HHFDC is H, uh, sorry, SB 2583, which is um, allows HHFDC to have a public land exemption um, for lands that are set aside to it by the governor, which means that they are not limited by a 65 year maximum um, on their leasehold units. They can now issue 99 year leasehold units like DHHL does and like Singapore does. And that will enable, um, that will open the door for HHFDC to start building these units. Um, the third measure in this grouping is that we have um, $10 million in the CIP budget for HPHA to start work on the first of these towers um, at the Mayor Wright site, which is currently slated for redevelopment and going through the process right now. So with these three measures together, for the first time, I'm optimistic that the executive branch now has the tools at its disposal in the toolbox to actually move the needle on housing, to start building the tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of units that are required to end the housing shortage. And I know we're all very excited um, for the change in administration that's gonna be happening next year, um, because I think that the new fresh energy that will be coming in will be critical to actually um, you know, resolving this issue for our whole community, which I believe is at the foundation of all of the social ills that, um, that plague our community. So again, I wanted to echo my thanks to um, Senate President Kochi, to um, the speaker, to um, the finance chair, to the Ways and Means chair, and all of the other legislators um, who have worked on these important issues over the years, mm -hmm. including those who have since you know retired and um, uh, you know made possible this um, outstanding work. Um, it reminds me of a phrase from I think it was um, F. Scott Fitzgerald. How did you go bankrupt? well, gradually, then suddenly. And as Senate President Kochi just described, um, we've been doing a lot of groundwork in the gradually phase. And this was the year where the suddenly happened and a lot of really fantastic um, change is now enabled as a result. So thank you again, um, Lila, and I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Senator Chang. All right, let me just go to a really quick rundown of, of next order. Next, we'll have Senator San Buenaventura, followed by Representative Takayama, then Senator Moriwaki, then Representative Hashimoto, Representative Tam, and uh, Representative Scott Saiki. All right, so next is Senator Joy San Buenaventura. Aloha. So um, I'm a state senator from the Big Island. I am Senate Chair of Human Services. And I, I differ from Representative Ward in that I believe this was a momentous legislative session. And that we, if I were to give us a grade, it would be an A+. Plus. Yes, not everything we wanted, um, succeeded, but a lot more than what we had expected, even pre-pandemic, um, has succeeded. And one of the big bills that I had been pushing for the past since even when I was chair, house chair of human services was the um, rein reinstatement of adult dental for Medicaid beneficiaries. So we, we finally were able to do that. And it wasn't just a basic dental, it was more than that. And hopefully we would prevent using the use of our ERs and our, um, and our ambulance for, for dent the dental needs of our poorest recipients, especially during the pandemic when our Medicaid enrollees had skyrocketed and the need for um, more Medicaid benefits um, it is clearly, was clearly shown during the pandemic. So I am thrilled about that. I'm thrilled also about the postpartum being increased. I'm also thrilled about that our TANF families, a lot of people think our welfare is forever and in reality it's not. 
it, within five years of receiving benefits, they are required they are required to get off our welfare rolls, and those are our TANF, our A2 needy families. And so, to help them get off the welfare rolls, we have also provided five hundred dollars per month for those who um, enroll in our first to work programs, and that goes towards housing um, as rental supplement. We have, as um, Senator Chang brought out, you know, we've increased our money, about $300 million into our rental housing revolving fund. Hopefully we could increase our, um, our, our rentals for those who are on subsistence level so that we, we decrease homelessness. We have, um, I don't know whether or not you folks know, but when we first enacted our Ohana Zones project back in 2018, the administration was opposed to it, fearing that we would leave these people in these temporary housing, when in reality it has proven successful, especially during the pandemic, when we needed to actually decrease congregate settings. And in case you folks don't realize, our homeless population actually had zero COVID infections because we were able to decrease our congregate settings and we were able to provide these temporary housing with wraparound services. It's not just tent cities that people that um, people were concerned about, but we actually have found housing for a third of those recipients who went into our homeless temporary programs into permanent housing. Uh, as Chair Luke has pointed out, our values also has helped us with increasing um, our monies towards not only pre-K, um, almost a universal pre-K, but our childcare. Alice families, the biggest expense of the working poor is childcare. And those of us who are retirees know that because our kids, right, use us as child, as for childcare, but we can't usually do that. So um, to help the labor, if we want to decrease our labor shortage, we really need to increase childcare. And we have put in this session, including um, prior to this session, a approximately $100 million towards, uh, towards stabilizing our childcare needs and increasing the wage subsidies of our childcare workers. It is kind of Skewed, our values are kind of skewed when we entrust our children to the lowest paid workers. So we really need to, if we really want to prevent abuse, ensure that our kids are taken care of, we really need to pay our childcare workers more because we are entrusting them with our most valued assets, right? With our loved ones. So this year we are putting our money where our mouth is, the state is, and we're increasing our childcare subsidies. I also want to point out um, this year, we've also taken, taken a huge leap towards child welfare reform. You know, it, it shouldn't take the death of Isabella Kaluna and Peter Boy Kema to make us realize that there is something seriously wrong with our child welfare system. So this year we put in $8 million more than what DHS thought they needed to basically fill in the vacancies. They had long-term 20% vacancies of their social workers where hopefully we could increase their pay with pay differentials. Um, also, we don't want to have foster parents who are in it only for the money. So we, we with the $8 million, hopefully we could increase the vetting of our foster parents give them the support that they need. And those who are involved in the foster program know that therapeutic foster homes are few and far between because they're the ones who take care of the most damaged children. And hopefully with providing them with supports and providing them with training and providing them with vetting that we will be able to create the kind of um, safety net so that our, the, the, those who are inflicted with child abuse, hopefully will be able to find safe homes. And this year we've, 
We've also included um, a working group of watchdogs to ensure the Department of Human Services does what it says that they're going to do, including an audit of our child welfare system by the auditor. And we're doing that. Uh, to answer, uh, oh, one other thing that um, Senator Rosbaker sort of alluded to that the, one of the best things about this session following the pandemic is not only that we were able to work with remotely. Um, one of my last town halls before the pandemic, it was February, 2020. And at that time, we found out that Medicaid and Medicare did not pay for telehealth. We have found out since the pandemic, how much telehealth could actually help people. Okay, not only for um, psychological and psychiatric, but also, you know, regular day-to-day, -day, just, just making sure that people are okay. And this year, we have increased um, insurance provisions for to make sure that telehealth is covered. I mean, it's not perfect, but it has gone a heck of a lot longer, a lot covers a lot more than we did prior to the pandemic. And one of the things that um, I want to also point out a couple of things uh, that Dale had asked about in the chat, okay? And he talked about homeowners association voting rights. And I represent a district where the subdivision homeowners are fighting amongst each other. And sometimes they actually bring the police in because it actually becomes like assaults and the like. And voting rights is one of the issues they're concerned about in, in Upper Puna. But um, one of the bills I finally passed this year was to have at least a working group to see what kind of requirements or requests or needs that each of these subdivisions are um, needing. Right now, the pilot program is only for my island because um, I tried in prior years to make it statewide and it has, every, it has failed every time. And I tried that like for five years in a row. So tried it for at least a pilot program for this year. And hopefully the working group would come up with recommendations. And if those recommendations um, work in my island and hopefully we can make it statewide. So what are the things, what's the bad? Okay, I talked, you all talked about the good because this was a momentous year. What about the bad? Um, Rep Ward talked about the feral chickens. On my island, we have feral pig problems. I have um, constituents who are afraid to even go in their backyard for fear about these, you know, one ton pigs, you know, attacking them and their dogs and the like. So um, hopefully, I hope to have like a working group going and talking to the various sub subdivisions as to how we can control the feral pigs without, um, people fearing for their lives, I guess, when hunters um, may be shooting off their guns to hunt these pigs, you know, in, in close um, home areas. And the second thing that I think we really need to look at in the future that we didn't really cover this session, we sort of covered it by having the five ombudsmen for the caregivers, it's basically, Although we have increased at least a one-time pay for nursing facilities and for care home givers to cover their COVID expenses, we really need, like just like what we did for the child care, we really need to increase supports for elder caregivers. There is a huge shortage of elder caregivers. And those of us who are in the baby boomer stage who are now having to care for their elder parents know how difficult it is to find caregivers, especially for those um, who have Alzheimer's, right? And dementia type problems. It's similar to finding like therapeutic foster homes for those who are child abuse victims. Only thing it's on the other spectrum of adult caregiving. So, Hopefully we can tackle that next year and um, let's hear more about that. Thank you so much, Lila. 
Thank you, Senator. All right, Representative Takayama, you're up next. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, pleasure to talk to you. As you've heard from multiple other speakers, um, this really was a great session, really was a historic session in many ways. Uh, I had the honor of chairing the House Higher Education and Technology Committee. And, um, you know, with the help of uh, Chair Luke, uh, there were many advances made in the area of higher education and technology, particularly as they relate to the pandemic. The pandemic showed us the importance of uh, connectivity, um, of the importance for um, Keiki to be educated, um, for Kupuna to uh, remain, um, to know of services that are available to them and for people who work from uh, remote locations to stay connected. Um, this past session, the University of Hawaii received $200 million designated to lead the effort to expand broadband capabilities, particularly in areas that are rural and are poorly connected. Um, so this would be a, a, a huge effort towards um, improving our broadband capabilities, modernizing our technology, connecting, connecting us to the mainland United States as well as Asia, and really is a, a huge step forward in um, accessing the billions of dollars in federal funds that are now available. So you'll be hearing a great deal about this in the months and years to come. Um, the other thing the pandemic showed us is the critical uh, shortage we have of health professionals as well as teachers. So this past session, uh, again, with the help of um, Chair Luke, the uh, JABSM, the John A. Barron School of Medicine, uh, received almost $7 million to improve um, the ability of uh, graduate medical students to train on the neighbor islands where we face the most critical shortage of physicians and nurses. Um, we also will be able to train our uh, medical students at our VA facilities, both the one at Tripler and the one that will soon be opened in about a year or so in Kapolei. And this will enable our medical uh, graduates to be versed in the issues of uh, elderly veterans, P PTSD and others, which many issues of which relate to the, the general uh, kupuna at large. Um, we also face a shortage of nurses. Uh, we don't face a shortage of people who want to become nurses. We face a shortage of nursing faculty. So um, we will be hiring 39 instructors for community college nursing, as well as um, our four-year nursing programs to increase the uh, um, number of nurses that we produce. And finally, for teacher training, um, we provided uh, $600,000 to, to improve the training of teachers on neighbor islands for the DOE. Um, this is really where we face a critical shortage in rural areas as well as neighbor islands. So um, in many respects, again, this was a, a great session, a historic session, and uh, I'm just glad to be a part of it. Mahalo. Thank you very much, Representative. All right, Senator Moriwaki, you're up next, please. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Laila. Aloha, everyone. Thank you, Kokua Consul and everyone here. Um, as everyone else said, it was a banner year. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, I go back to what Chair Lucas said, you know, this, this is a year where our values, our heart uh, was really fundamental and foundational in the kinds of things we funded, the policies that we passed. Um, I'm going to focus on the collaboration uh, with the House and Senate and with over a hundred different agencies that work with us in the uh, Kokua, in the um, Kupuna Caucus. Uh, we had uh, we had been limited to five bills, but there were many more, uh, and so all of them were supported by members of the Kupuna Caucus. And uh, along with my co-convener Troy Hashimoto, Representative Hashimoto um, was instrumental 
in not only looking at housing, looking at human services, uh, and a number of other bills that we try to push through. There were bills left on the table, but always that's something we come back to and we, we work harder uh, during the interim. So I do want to say that the two values that I see um, on what, what I, I like to focus on in, in the bills that we have is one, how do we have preventive services? How do we aid, help our, our seniors age in place? What kinds of things can we do to support that? Um, and there were a couple of bills that were passed. There was the um, driver's license bill. It's renew the renewal is four years instead of two years up to age 80. Uh, and that again is, is a way of providing incentives to keep healthy uh, and be able to drive because um, I just talked to a dear friend who's very active and she's shut in at home because her, her keys were taken away, her license was taken away. And, um, and it, it restricts you and, and restricts your, your ability to, to stay in touch with your friends and your activities. So, so I think that was an important bill. The, um, the other was um, the um, Hawaii Retirement Savings Program. That's been a long time in coming uh, for those who don't have any, a way of saving for their retirement. Uh, this makes them plan forward so that you're not sitting there retired one day and not have an income or not have enough to support the lifestyle that you're used to. So those two bills were, I think, really instrumental. A couple of bills that didn't pass, the state health insurance assistance program. I know uh, President Kochi mentioned, you know, having something in the mail about Medicare well, again, it's planning forward and that program um, would have uh, increased um, um, helpers to, to assist people to know not buying any, any plan, but knowing what plan to buy and, and keeping yourself healthy um, to, to as long as you can stay at home. Um, the other, and, and I, I am the chair of the government operations committee. So I always look at ways in which we can um, be more efficient. Uh, we did pass bills that uh, increased ways in which we could centralize information technology so that we could have one place where people can, can share data and, and be able to serve the public better. Uh, and also in procurement and how we buy, buy goods and services, making that much more efficient and cost cost us less in buying in bulk uh, different services and programs. Um, the other is uh, one that that was a policy measure that we passed, which was combining, I think someone in your chat said SB 3113, it was combining the Kupuna Caregiver and the Kupuna Program. Um, these two programs serve the elderly. And if you look at the goals of the program, the kinds of services that that program provides, one provides support for the caregivers, the other it services, but they all provide the same service. So one way of being more efficient, being much more um, 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 cost effective and serve more people is to combine those two programs, which we did this year. And I, I'm really pleased that it gives the flexibility. You know, we have the same goals, but we have to be soft on on the way we do things and the more flexibility we can have in the ways programs operate so that we can move with the evolving, changing um, community that we have, I think the more efficient and more effective we can be and we could save money and do a lot more. Uh, so, so that's one program. The, uh, the other is um, Joy, Senator San Buenaventura talked about the homeless pro programs. Uh, Ohana Zones, incredibly important. So is one program that we established, and thanks to Chair Luke as well, on, on um, passing this um, Homeless and Housing Solutions Office. It establishes an office, a one-stop place that will get data, that will look at services, that will be able to make sure that we don't duplicate services, but that we expand services so that we can help those to prevent them from becoming homeless, but also ending homelessness so that we can have services that, that really range the needs of what the feds don't don't fund, the state can, rather than duplicating, we will be serving 
what needs to be funded. So, so I'm really pleased with that measure, and I hope that the as uh, we see um, people moving into the administration, that we will see that being implemented uh, in in a way that that I think will help our community better. Um, the the other I said the second goal is is to help the long term care the frail elderly, and um, we did pass a couple of bills um, that that I think are important. One one was not a bill; it started as a bill with the Kupuna Caucus nose. Uh, which was the ombudsman, um, John McDermott. Um, thanks to you all these years, John is retiring. And so at least we can do this for John <laughs> before he goes. Uh, we do have now five ombudsmen um, that will then be in the community across the state. Uh, and what I hope is that the collaboration between the Office of Healthcare Administration or Healthcare, what is it called, OCA, um, which we allow to, to have um, more flexibility in how they use their special fund, that Office of Healthcare Assurance Special Fund can be used in ways, again, to expand services, to inspect the, the, all the long-term care facilities and work in collaboration with the ombudsman program that sees programs um, that may need help uh, and may need some inspection, that there be better use of the resources of these programs. So with that, I'm going to, I think, turn it over to Representative Hashimoto. I see there is my co-convener, if I'm not going out of line, Lila. But I want to thank everybody. It was a, a real banner year, and, and it was everybody, everybody working together. And it's just wonderful when everybody works together. So mahalo nui Thank you, Senator. All right, Rep Hashimoto. Are you prepared? Thank you. Thanks, Lila, and good to see everyone here. Thank you, Senator Morawaki, my co-convener for the Kupuna Caucus. I also want to um, recognize uh, Rep Takayama, who's co-convener with myself in the House uh, for Kupuna Caucus. I think we we summarize a lot of the the great bills that we we were able to pass uh, through Kupuna Caucus, um, and and there was so much more I think that it encompassed um, what we were able to accomplish with the help of so many people like Chair Luke and. Um, you know, Senate President, Speaker Psyche. Uh, and so I think it was a great year uh, for some of the initiatives that we've been working on for, for a number of years. I do want to just highlight because this is a good and the bad and the ugly. And I think one of the ones that we were a little bit disappointed that we weren't able to get to the finish line, we were so close, was our care, our choice. I think that was a big access issue that um, we, we couldn't get past conference. I think it was just differences within the House and the Senate primarily on um, physician assistants and EPRNs. And so I think we will have to continue to focus on how we can find some uh, reconciliation between the two, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's, it's really the neighbor islands that are being impacted in rural communities who don't have access. So I think that's, that's a lot of work that's cut out for us to continue pushing in that issue. I know Senator Morawaki and I were really working hard to figure out some type of kupuna rent um, program that we were trying to figure out. I think that's still ongoing and we have to figure out what is the best way to um, deliver that type of uh, rent supplement program. I know we already have the state rent supplement. We were looking at a different type of pilot, but I think in the meantime, at least we have the TANF and the TANOF uh, program of $500 that will be able to assist um, you know, folks that are, are on that program. And I think that will go a long way in the interim. In addition to Kapuna Caucus, I also serve as the vice chair of the housing committee, and we, we did a lot of work um, on, on the housing committee. I think Senator Chang spoke a, a little bit of what we, we did. Um, you know, it was a banner year on the money side, over a, almost a, nearly a billion dollars devoted to housing-related um, type of initiatives. I think some of the smaller ones you may not have heard of is we worked really hard on Section 8 incentives. Uh, because we, we know with, with the pandemic, a lot of people are having a hard time identifying those who accept Section 8 vouchers. And so we created a, an important incentive program that will allow landlords to get incentives if they start to rent to Section 8 um, individuals. Uh, so it's a, a signing bonus. And also there's also ability to, if there's damage, there's a reimbursement program. We also were able to prohibit um, you know, discrimination against your income, your source of income for Section 8 um, 
And so I think that's a big step in the right direction. And so no longer can you say no Section 8. And I think that's a very important step in the right direction to making sure that um, we, we get people housed and people want to be a part of the Section 8 program and, and to rent to those folks. Ohana zones will be extremely important. I think a lot of folks have talked about that. Um, one of the big things we also funded was the Bolodrome project, at, which is a pilot program um, for Department of Fine Homelands to start their first rental project at the old stadium site. So that was $41 million um, that will be going out. Um, it's uh, Stanford Carr has that, our, uh, that contract to do that. And that was the last piece of the puzzle for him. So we'll see how, how a rental, 100% rental project will work for DHHL. So lots of great things that happened this past session. I think there's a lot more work ahead of us. Um, and I think we're all committed to doing that, but it will only take you folks continuing to be involved. So I hope to see you at our upcoming Kapuna Caucus meetings, because uh, we're going to get back right to work um, in the next month. Um, so great seeing everyone and, and thanks for all of your support. Thank you very much, Representative Hashimoto. Representative, Representative Adrian Tam. Welcome on board. Thank you, Lila. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I, I have followed the legislative session for about a couple of years now. This is the seventh legislative session that I have followed. And I think that this was um, by far the best one that I've seen um, in terms of, you know, things we've got accomplished and I'm more optimistic about Hawaii's future. Um, I have the honor of vice chairing the House Committee on Health, Human Services and Homelessness. And some of the things that we, initiatives that we worked on is definitely the um, adult dental benefits restoration and the whole part of health coverage. Um, I wanna to talk to you about how important that is. And that is because, um, you know, especially the postpartum coverage, it, um, Hawaii has, I know the United States has the highest um, maternal mortality rates for any modern nation. And it particularly affects women of color, women living in poverty and women living in rural areas that aren't, doesn't have equal, equal access to um, hospitals and medical centers. Um, but some of the bills that we have passed in the legislature is that we do have a um, physician and doctor shortage and healthcare worker shortage. So we put a lot of money towards um, loan repayment programs for JAPSOM. And some of them is even through the Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, and this is a good one because I know a lot of medical students and for them, it's impossible to hold a job and go to medical school at the same time. And a lot of them, even though they end up making a lot of good money further down the line, sometimes it's just not worth it for them to pursue a medical degree. Um, we've also um, looked at ways to increase our shortage of nurses by passing a bill that would allow nurses to, who are licensed in other, air, in other states to basically get licensed in a state through endorsements. Um, we passed a bill that would create a early lung cancer screening task force. Um, lung cancer is a um, major um, disease, one of the biggest cancers that is affecting Hawaii right now. And I wanna thank the, um, the, the folks at American Lung Association for helping us pass that. And a lot of this is thanks to the help of Chair Luke, um, Speaker Psyche, uh, President Kochi, and um, Senator Donovan Del Cruz, as well as our uh, Health and Human Services Chairs, um, Chair Shaquille Kolole and Chair Yamane, and Chair Joyce and Buenaventura, as well as Chair uh, Roz Baker. Uh, moving on to some of the ugly, I was really hoping that we could pass some of um, the noise reduction bills that we have. Senator Moriwaki and I have introduced a lot of them and we're hoping to come back next year to pass them again. We, do, we are trying to be more mindful this time that some of these are people's livelihoods such as 
um, loud mopeds may be their only mode of transportation. Um, so um, Senator Mori Walkie are, and I are committed to working on that as well as um, speaker psyche. So um, that is all that I have to say. I wanna thank Kokuo Council for allowing me to be here and allowing me the opportunity to talk to all of you about my views on the legislative session. Thank you, Representative Tam. All right, House Speaker Scott Psyche, are you ready? If you could unmute yourself. Representative Psyche. Hello, Representative Psyche. Can you hear us? Can you please unmute yourself? Well, maybe he's on a call. All right, so while we wait for Representative Psyche, uh, we can start now taking questions. And um, if all the legislators will unmute yourselves, then you can participate in the discussion too and ask each other questions, if you will. All right, so uh, who in the audience would like to start? Rick, all right. I was actually asked by the board to ask one question. I actually have more, but I'll start with just one. So just open to the open to all of you legislators. What was the, and some of you have addressed this already, but what was your biggest disappointment? Hello, hello. Oh, 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 let's go with that first. All right. Think about Thank it. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Speaker. Please go ahead. Sorry, I was, a uh, reporter was intervening just now. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone has just said so much today. I, I don't know what else to add. Um, I think more, you know, I think, really just on behalf of the House and the Senate, I want to thank the Kukua Council for, um, you know, all of your adv advocacy this past session. I think the Kukua Council can take, you know, take a lot of credit for what happened um, in what, you know, many have said is, has been somewhat of a historic session. I think we were in a fortunate position where we were able to take care of some unmet needs that we had not being able to do so in the past, um, but I think it just uh, it was uh, it was really because the legislature was able to work closely with um, community uh, advocates and organizations like the council. So I know that on this call there are a lot of in the audience there are a lot of uh, individuals who are here on all kinds of different bills, um, but you know it shows that collectively I think we can. I think it's a good lesson for all of us. If we work together collectively, then um, we can just do some great stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So uh, we'll go into our questions. Rick, you were asking a question. Well, I'll back up and I'll, I'll, I'll start with just thanking, which I know Lila will do as well, but thanking everybody for being here and thanking you for an incredible session as always, but this one in particular um, had some, some huge wins um, and bad and ugly as well. Um, bad and ugly for me, um, um, Rep Troy Hashimoto, you, you addressed it, but the our care, our choice, we're really confused what happened there. And I know we'll have more of a dialogue. I'll save that part for Kapuna Caucus when we actually do meet. Um, I also, there was hugely disappointed in the hearing aid um, Bill, and I, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time on that. You may know I have a program through the Rotary, uh, uh, Gift of Sound, giving hearing aids away, and it just really puzzles me how insurances do not cover it. They call it a non-essential service. Uh, for those that are <laughs> in need of hearing aids, it's essential. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about what happens with the hearing aids now that it's referred to. Um, for a review or uh, to, to um, um, the auditor. I, I'd like to know what that means and what it means going forward being a biennium. Do we start all over, all those? And then I started with what was your greatest disappointment? And then one last question is, do we have any concerns about any vetoes that we need to be trying to focus on at this point from the governor? I'll stop there and just open that up. Thank you. So talk about the hearing aid, um, unless anyone else wants to chime in. 
So basically, whenever you increase, whenever there's a potential for increasing health care insurance premiums, we need to do um, a sunrise analysis. And that's what the whole um, auditor referral is, is to do a sunrise analysis. And I know there was one done uh, years ago, but apparently the insurance commissioner did not feel that that was sufficient in light of the the other um, in the other services that have impacted the healthcare insurance industry this year, you know, like telehealth, for instance. Um, so that's where we are. Hopefully, the sunrise analysis would come in with basically saying, with the low end of coverage of only about fifteen hundred dollars there wouldn't be much of an impact to increase the healthcare insurance premiums of everyone else uh, that, or it would be negligible that we will then be able to pass um, something like that. And, and I think Senator Baker is on the line, isn't she? And she can, she can fill that in, but that, because, you know, as, as a co-convener of the DeafBlind Task Force, that was one of our, major issues this year too. So I was disappointed with that as well. Senator Baker, do you want to address that? Oh, maybe last one. Is she online? I don't see her. I don't either. Well, anyone else on that uh, multi-layered question have anything to say? Rick, I, I just want to know what we need to do as advocates. I, I'm I yeah. not very familiar with Sunrise uh, analysis that the senator mentioned, um, and I, you know, we need to know and right. soon how to start that, how to how to start advocating for that. Yeah, because I would wonder, being a biennium year, as is referred for the Sunrise analysis, that keeps the bill alive. So we don't have. Correct. Okay. And so we need yeah. to await the sunrise analysis is for the auditor to come up with a recommendation as right. to how much of an impact the ink covering Correct. this service does to everybody else's health care insurance premiums. That is what the sunrise analysis does. And then it's up to the legislature to determine knowing what the impact is or the recommendations of the Sunrise Analysis as to whether or not to pass the bill. But Senator, how do we, how do we um, advocate for the Sunrise Analysis or make sure that that gets started, please? Uh, we did that already by passing the, um, by passing the re joint resolution. Okay. So it's, it's, we just need to wait for them to finish the Sunrise Analysis. Okay, thank you, Senator. So I'll move it to, are there any concerns about vetoes? I was reading about the telehealth in the paper yesterday with the phone call issue. Does anybody want to address that? I mean, is that going to be a concern? Because telehealth is pretty important. Any answers? No, okay. Okay, um, I have a few questions. Um, let me just bring up some topics that were concerns for members, our community members in Kukul Council. One was ethics and corruption. And then crime, the increased crime, inflation, the cost of living, um, fuel prices, um, housing, We've talked about affordable housing, but all aspects of housing where many of you have, of course, heard from um, the real estate uh, commission or other realtors that real estate prices are out of control, not out of control, but out of reach for many people. Um, supply chain shortages, uh, employee shortages, high quit rates, 
labor shortage. Um, this might have to do with crime also, but public safety. If any would, of you would like to address these, idea, uh, these concerns. Hi, this is Representative Takayama. Let me try. <laughs> um, not on all of the issues you brought up, but in particular, I wanted to talk a little bit about crime because I know this is something in which um, many of us are concerned about. Um, what we're seeing crime-wise is um, basically a return to the crime rates uh, in terms of violent and property crimes that they were prior to the uh, pandemic. You know, when, when in the past two years, when um, our communities were sh largely shut down, uh, people, were, people were not um, commuting to work, uh, there was a lot less um, interactivity among our communities, crime went down and that was to be expected. I mean, people were at home, so there were a lot fewer burglaries and, and thefts that occurred. Well, now society is returning back to uh, quote normal and uh, so are our crime rates. Um, I just want to mention, though, that um, one thing that passed last year was a bill that was um, introduced by Representative Hashimoto on behalf of the uh, Kupuna Caucus, and that was to increase the penalties for crimes that were committed against seniors. Anyone defined, um, that's defined anyone as anyone over the age of 60. And if you read, read in the news, you know, just recently the Honolulu prosecutor invoked that law um, in an effort to um, put in prison someone who punched uh, a security guard who was um, over the age of 60. So we are seeing this law being implemented, I, I think in a good way. Um, those, everyone who commits a crime deserves to be punished. Uh, those uh, in particular who commit crimes against uh, seniors deserve to be punished extra. And that's what the, the law does. Um, so happy to, address that part of it. I'll leave it to others to talk about some of the other issues. Would, would anyone else like to respond? You know, uh, Lila, there's a question uh, in the chat from Kate on 11 about section eight, um, addressing the, it's good that there are more funds, but that uh, no education on renters responsibility to care for house and community. I think getting at the uh, problems that Section 8 has because the um, landlords are, are leery because of uh, potential for damage to the property or that kind of thing. Um, I think that's true in some cases and untrue in others. Uh, um, if anybody would want to comment on that, that would be uh, welcome. You know, I put a I put a reply. Um, I'm talking about. So I've worked for Section Eight before. There's 10 day notices. If you don't correct it within 10 days, and you get three 10 day notices with a month, within a month, then you're evicted. And if you're evicted, you no longer qualify for Section Eight. So that's a pretty steep hill to climb. Is that the same here, for folks? Anybody want to address that? I think I think the problem it, it is different on both sides. If you're a renter. You want to get the place, and you're and and it's hard because there are so few places available. If you're going to make, if you're a landlord, you're going to make your your um, property available for Section Eight. You're you've heard that uh, low low income renters uh, come in and they trash the place, and it's not worth it. So, is there something uh, legislatively that addresses that or can address that, or is that just uh, uh, an advocate's uh, position to try and change behaviors or, or what? Okay, so. Oh, okay, can we start with Reptan who has his hand? Okay, I could take a crack at um, the Section 8 question. Um, so many landlords and property managers are not willing to go through the whole Section 8 process because of the requirements that um, their housing units have to be in, like the good condition, the HUD standards that they have to do have to be in, because many of their rentals are in walk-ups, and some of these walk-ups are not up to date. Um, and for them to qualify to get the Section Eight tenant in, they would need to address those concerns. Um, a couple of years ago, Senator Chang 
passed a bill that would create a fund that would reimburse landlords um, for any damages that may be caused through Section 8 tenants. And um, I don't... I don't remember where it's at, but I know that there was funding for it and the Hawaii Public Housing Authority has a, um, a, um, a liaison between their tenants and landlords um, that can help address those concerns. But the main thing was that this these bills were to incentivize um, landlords to rent out to Section 8. Uh, my family works in property management, and for us, we want, want Section 8 tenants because a lot of this is guaranteed rent because it's coming from the government, and we it's not like um, something where in case something were to happen, like, you know, we, would, we wouldn't have to chase after them. So those are just my views and my input, my, what I have to say about that. Thank you. I see a Joyce and Buenaventura has her hand up. Uh, yes. So um, thank you. And thank you, Rep. Tam. Basically, he answered the question that there is funding, that it's really a myth that it's not covered because we do have funding to cover uh, Section 8 um, property damage issues. And really, there aren't that many Section 8 vouchers around, and I, and I do appreciate Rep. Tam's response in that it, it does guarantee payment to landlords. And um, we really need more, more landlords to accept Section 8 because we're not going to be able to do the bridge housing transition from the homeless into permanent housing un unless people are willing to accept Section 8. So... We're doing what we can to ensure that there is no disincentive. And um, anybody who has a problem with trashing uh, by a Section 8 tenant should let us know because we do have funds that cover that. Barbara? Um, I'd just like to address Kate on 11's um, uh, situation. I think we've gotten ahead of what her situation is. She, or what she's asking, is that renters need to be educated uh, about the program and, and you know that they shouldn't trash it instead of talking about how we're gonna throw them out when they trash it or give them so many warnings before they're, asked, uh, before they're evicted or asking the state to pay for repairs. I would like to start with uh, what Kate on 11 brought up and that is educating uh, Section 8 uh, participants in how to take care of a place. I think that's where we need to start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Well, it's after one o'clock. Um, I would like to give legislators an opportunity to make a closing statement. Um, so if anyone would like to volunteer and then um, followed by Justin Wong and myself. So would any legislators like to make a closing statement? No, wow, this is <laughs> quite different. Um, Justin, Justin Wong, would you like to make a closing statement for the Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans? Yeah, uh, on behalf of the Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans, I want to thank all of the legislators who uh, participated today. Uh, a lot of the uh, comments were very informative, and uh, uh, we'll be seeing you next next year uh, with, with uh, any ideas that we come up with uh, uh, after, after the session's over. Thank you very much, Justin. Well, thank you to everyone for participating in Cocoa Council and Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans. 16th Annual Legislative Review and the Shining Light Awards Ceremony. We invite you to join us in future programs as we meet some of our 2022 primary and general election candidates, discuss proposed legislative measures, discuss concerns about health care, kapuna care, housing concerns including affordable housing, homelessness, and houselessness, and homeowner and condominium association issues 
and much more. I look forward to seeing all of you in person and I will end today's meeting at this time. Thank you very much for all of your participation, all the information that you shared with us. Mahalo. Thank you, Lila. Aloha. On behalf of the legislators, I just wanted to say thank you too. Thank you very much, Rep. Takayama. Appreciate seeing all of you. Thank you very much for joining in. Please stay well and expect to see us soon. Thank you.